Hey there internets, I'm Michael and this is a review of Tyrants of the Underdark by Gale Force 9. But what is it? I mean if we look at the box here, we've got some black faced guys with silver hair and pointy ears. And they're in some sort of underground caverns. Hmm. So it's about silver haired, pointy eared guys underground. Well, it sort of is. You see, those silver haired guys with the pointy ears, they're Dark Elves, otherwise known as Drow, and they live in a place called the Underdark, which is this evil realm underneath the earth. And in this game, you are all vying to control the Underdark, to be the masters of it. You're members of the ruling council, and the whole idea is that you're recruiting units to work for you, agents to do your bidding. And you're then using those to control areas of the board. What this actually works out as mechanically is that it is a deck builder crossed with area control. You see, those agents that you're controlling are your cards. Those are what you're buying and putting in. And when you send them out on a mission, that represents playing the card. When you get it back into your hand, that represents they've come back having finished their last mission and are ready to be deployed once more. So it works quite nice thematically. Then obviously what they're doing is interacting with the board, which is the Underdark, with all these weird Underdarky named places. And if you control areas, that represents, you know, that you have control, that you've got more troops there than your opponents, etc. And so this all works very well. So how does the game actually play? Well, it's very typical of a deck builder in the style of play, really. You'll start your turn with your hand of cards. You'll play your cards. Those will give you things that you can do. Now, there are two forms of resources in this game. There is influence, which is the simplest resource, which is kind of your money. And that will allow you to buy better cards from the market here. And there's also power. And power is what allows you to put these lovely little troops out on the board to try and gain control. It also enables you to assassinate opponents' troops and to remove their spies. There are then other things that the cards themselves will allow you to do, dependent on the card. There are things that will allow you to supplant troops, assassinate troops, without actually needing power. Also, there are cards that allow you to place spies. There are also cards which will allow you to promote cards, and this is a big part of the deck building. Because a common feature of deck builders is that refining your deck and making it work better. And the promoting is how you will get cards out of your deck in order to streamline it. But it not only does that, it helps you gain victory points for the end of the game. You see, every card you buy in this game is worth points just for being in your deck to show that you have been busy working and gaining support and gaining troops to be able to deploy etc but also when you promote someone you're basically saying you're too important for me to send you out on these missions anymore you've been promoted to a higher level and for doing that you get even more victory points. The better the card is, the more victory points you get for promoting it. So there's kind of a balance of wanting to promote the really good, powerful cards because they'll get you more victory points, but wanting to keep them in your deck so you don't want to promote those, which creates a very nice element to the game. So that's pretty much how the game all plays. You carry on turns using your cards to do the things and to gain abilities etc and then you will eventually finish the game which is triggered in one of two ways either you run out of troops to place on the board or you run out of market cards once the game ends you will then total up your score and you'll get points for the areas that you control on the board and you'll also get points for the cards in your deck as well as any troops that you have assassinated You'll also get points during the game. Some cards will gain you points, but also certain areas or sites of the board, when you control them, if you have total control, which represents that you are the only one there, you'll gain victory points each turn you have that. So you can build up victory points over the course of the game that will go towards your end score.
So that's a rough idea of how the game all plays and works. What do I think of it? Well, we'll start with the artwork. Now, the box is actually very representative of the artwork in this game, and you can see the board is quite muted but very detailed and lovely. Each of the sites kind of has a zoomed in image of what's behind it and it just works really nice. It is very dark, but it is called the Underdark. It is going to be dark. That's to be expected. The actual artwork on the cards can be a bit variable. Some are not as good as others, but for the most part they are very nice to look at. So that's probably enough on the art, you know, it's very much your typical D&D art. If you like that, if you're into the Underdark, you'll probably enjoy the art in this. With regards to components, there's quite a lot going on with this, really. I mean, one of the main components is the cards, and unfortunately, they're not the greatest quality of card. So if you're going to be playing this a lot, you probably will want to sleeve this, and I'm not a fan of sleeving games. So we'll see how well mine fares up. With regards to the player boards and stuff, that's all actually very good high quality fit card that's holding up nicely, the same weight as the tokens. Another big part of this game, obviously, is all these bits of plastic, your little troops and spies. Now, I've heard a lot of negative things about these said by other people, but I think these are really nice. Now, there is a one problem with them. I like the way they look, I like the way they work on the board, but there is a slight problem, and that's the colour choices. Now, if you are colour blind, the colour choices they've gone for, you've got red and orange, very similar, and you've got the black, which is kind of a dark grey, and dark blue, which can be very similar, especially in low light conditions. So I'm not sure about those choices of colour. Now, with the exception of the spies, they have done somewhat to kind of make up for this to help colorblind people and in general to help them be distinguishable in that the troops and the player boards have the house symbol on also all of the troops despite them being a similar style of being a shield stood up are actually all slightly different shapes as well so that's very good to help people distinguish but the changes are very small and difficult to notice so that isn't ideal but the actual components themselves are very nice and the board as well is a good quality board so what about the gameplay well I love this game <laughs> it has to be said um, it didn't make it into my top games of 2016 just because I hadn't really played it by then um, <laughs> if I had it would have been in there this is a really good game I'm a big fan of deck building, so that it, it's going to win me over with that. I'm a big fan of area control, and the way it combines the two works really well. It feels like these two mechanics were meant to be together. They merge so seamlessly. There's no things that feel like they just don't quite work or that they're grinding against each other. It works and flows smoothly to create this really engaging game. Now, there is one problem with regards to player numbers. You see, they've done a really good job on the scaling with regards to the board, in that if you're playing with two players, you use this central section, and then three, you use one of the edges, and four, you use the whole board. That works really well for scaling. One thing that doesn't work well, the market deck. You've got the same size market deck, no matter the number of players, and the same end condition that the market deck would end the game. Now I have only ever had the market deck run out in a four player game. So it is kind of a pointless end condition for anything other than four. I think if no one was really trying to put troops out in a three player game it might happen. Two player game it's never gonna happen. The other issue is that there's no kind of catch-up mechanic in this. It is very much a rich get richer game, especially with regards to as you're playing, even if you don't have the total control giving you victory points, if you've got control, you're getting lots of influence every turn. 
guaranteed influence every turn, which just means you can buy all the best cards. And if you've got the best cards early on, you're able to just use those to gain that lead. So it's very much a rich get richer rule set. Now, in multiplayer, this can be mitigated somewhat, because if someone's getting too far ahead of the other players, they'll tend to pounce on them and go, oh, we need to stop that player. They're doing too well. It has a self-writing mechanism like that. In a two-player, there's only you and the other player. So there's not a lot you can really do if one person is getting in the lead. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, because it just means that it's rewarding good plays, and that it means that if you get in the lead to begin with, you're going to be more likely to stay in the lead. I will say that it actually does work very well, despite those issues, for all the different player numbers. So, of course, two can play that game. And I actually really enjoy this as a two player. I've enjoyed it as a three player. I've enjoyed it as a four player. Every single player number, I have enjoyed it. But the game does feel different at those player numbers. It always seems to run about the same time because of running out of troops is the main way the game ends. But it does feel different. The main thing is different strategies will work differently for the different player numbers. For example, in a two-player game, it's very difficult to try and play a promote-heavy or buy-cards-heavy game because then you're leaving your opponent to just wash across the board and have complete dominance of the board. Whereas in a multiplayer game, especially a free or especially a four-player game, sorry, you can kind of be one player who sits back and does that promoting and just buying lots of cards and promoting lots of cards and getting a really refined deck while the others are battling out for control and keeping each other in check. So, what else is there to say about this? Well, I haven't talked yet about the replay value, so that's one thing I do want to touch on. Now, the base game itself comes with four market decks and you use two a game. This is really good for the replay value, because even just two market decks, the variation that you have, the randomness of not only the cards coming up in the market deck, but also the cards coming up within your own hand of what you've bought and when you've bought them, and then corresponding that with you reacting to what other players are doing, means that even with just two decks, there's a huge amount of replay value. You'll easily get 20, 30 plays without feeling like you're playing the same game. But then they put four decks in, which means you've got the different combinations of how those decks work. Now, the decks don't hugely change the game. They don't dramatically change what you're going to do. They just introduce new options for how you're going to play, new mechanics. So, for example, the demons introduce the insane outcasts, which are kind of a curse to people that creates a nice different just changes the game up that little bit. And then with the elementals, you have the kind of synchronization of having the same types of cards. So it kind of just changes up what you're trying to buy and how you're buying. So those work really nice to just refresh the game. And they've already announced two new, I think two more decks coming for this um, with an expansion. So that'll be even more kind of variety and replay value that that will add. Not that you need it, you'll have probably hundreds of plays able to be done with the four decks that come in this base game. So in summary then, what do I think of Tyrants of the Underdark? It is a fantastic game, it is absolutely brilliant. If you enjoy deck building, if you enjoy the territory control, then you will enjoy this game. If you enjoy D&D, you will also enjoy this game, but it is no way a requirement. If you are a huge D&D fan who absorbs all the lore, etc., you might find this a bit disappointing because it doesn't have a huge D&D feel to it. It's just got slight hints towards the D&D with the flavour text, the names, going, oh, I recognise that creature, I recognise that creature, etc. If it's that sort of level of interest you have in D&D, this will appeal hugely for that kind of nostalgia aspect. So... This is very much a light strategy game. It's no way a heavy game, but I would not recommend it to new gamers. Because 
of the mechanics involved, it can be a bit complicated for new gamers to learn. I would recommend this more for people who have already played a deck builder and played an area control game, have an idea of how those mechanics work, and then all they're having to get their head around is how they combine. And that is probably the perfect kind of audience for this game. Okay, that is my thoughts on Tyrants of the Underdark. I do hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, do check out the rest of the videos on the channel. It's worth subscribing and sharing it with your friends and family. And as always, thanks for watching and bye for now.